following sermon is a part of our Go Deeper Into the Gospels series. It was presented on Sunday, January 14th, 2018 by Pastor Daniel Calcano at Glad Tidings Church of God in Font Hill, Ontario. It is titled, His Early Life, Part 2. For more videos, please subscribe to this YouTube channel visit our website at gladtidingschurchofgod.com. Three weeks ago, on December 24th, we explored the first half of Matthew chapter 2. The what, what, what is that about? The introduction of King Herod, the arrival of the Magi from the east, uh, and how they were drawn to Bethlehem to pay homage to Jesus. So I mentioned that time, and I mentioned a couple times last week, that the events of the Magi occurred months after Jesus was born. So he was growing into a toddler by the time uh, the Magi showed up. Now, we preached, I preached about it that Sunday because of how associated it is with Christmas, with the birth of Jesus and that story. So that's why we jumped ahead. But now we're back to the events that took place just following the, uh, the Magi showing up. But you'll notice last week, Luke didn't include this story. Luke didn't include this story, but he included the events that took place in the days and weeks following Jesus' birth. The circumcision of Jesus, Mary's purification, Jesus' redemption as a firstborn, the fact that Joseph, Mary, and Jesus encountered Simeon and Anna. And then Luke says that they returned and went back to Nazareth. But that's actually not what happened. He's jumping ahead. What happened was they returned back to Bethlehem. I think they lived in Bethlehem for probably a year or two. And the reason why we know that from this story is that the Magi showed up, right, at some point in the story. They're in Bethlehem. So they must have lived in Bethlehem for at least several months. And, of course, that's when they showed up, these Magi from the Empire, Parthia, the Parthian Empire, they paid homage to Jesus, they worshipped him, if you will, as king, and they presented to him the famous gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But before we continue on into our text, because we're going to take up that story in Matthew chapter 2, so if you'd like to follow along in the Bible, it's Matthew chapter 2. I want us to think about something here that's going to be very important for what we're going to explore today, that the Jewish people believe in this idea that the Messiah is the final redeemer of Israel. That implies... If he's the final redeemer, that there were previous redeemers. In fact, Moses, Moses is called the first redeemer. And they have a saying, the Jewish people, and it's a very old ancient saying, that like the first redeemer, so will the final redeemer be. So what are they saying here? Like Moses, so will Jesus be. What Moses went through, Jesus will go through. What, what Moses was like, Jesus will be like. The Messiah will be like. So what Matthew is going to be doing is tailoring the events of the birth narrative of Jesus to sort of remind us that Jesus is like Moses. The final redeemer will be like the first redeemer. And along those lines, the gospel writers also want us to understand that Jesus is the embodiment of Israel. That all that Israel goes through, the Messiah will go through. All that God expects of Israel to be and to accomplish the Messiah will be and accomplish. So, I want us to keep that in mind. That as we read through, in this case, in this week, the Gospel of Matthew, it's important to understand that he's trying to get us to realize that Jesus is the embodiment, the fulfillment of Israel. That he embodies everything that Israel was supposed to be and accomplish. And I want us to be reminded of what we spoke about a few weeks ago, that there's a Jewish method of Bible interpretation called Midrash. Midrash means that you focus in on a word or a phrase from the Hebrew Scriptures, and you point. You use that word or phrase to point to some deeper meaning. You recall we looked at the fact that Isaiah said that the virgin will be with child and will give give born, uh, birth to a child and will call his name Emmanuel. Well, Matthew picked up on the fact that the word virgin is there, and he and he linked it to the fact that Mary was a virgin. Even though originally that text had nothing to do with a virgin birth, he used it to point to a deeper truth, the deeper truth of the virgin birth of Jesus, right? So we're going to see that again with Matthew here in the text of Matthew chapter 2. 
So let's turn to that. Firstly, we're continuing where we are. We're continuing after the story of the Magi visiting Jesus. And that's what Matthew is about to refer to here when he said, Now when they had gone, meaning when the Magi had left Bethlehem, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child and to destroy him. So, after the Magi left Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, an angel warned Joseph to escape the coming persecution from Herod by going to Egypt. So he warned them, Herod is going to come out, be coming after Jesus to kill him, so escape. And, and, and they did that by going to Egypt. So, let's be reminded about Herod, King Herod. Herod the Great, if you will, as he was called. He was furious that there could be potentially be a newborn king, right? As the Magi had informed him. This was threatening to his position as the king of Judah, the king of the Jews. So he intended to kill the child, which was par for the course for Herod. <laughs> Whenever he had a problem, he just killed people. He killed his wife, he killed his children. He just killed anybody and everybody who he felt threatened him. So... He didn't do that with the Magi. We explored why a few weeks ago. But he didn't go with the Magi. Have you ever thought about this? He didn't go with the Magi. And he didn't have anybody follow them. There's probably political reasons why he didn't go with them or have them follow them. But even though he knew the Messiah was going to be born in Bethlehem, he didn't know where in Bethlehem. He didn't know which child. So what did he do? Well, Matthew continues and tells us that Herod was going to kill every single newborn child from two years of age and under. We'll get to that in a second. But Matthew tells us what Joseph did. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother while it was still night, so they left secretly, if you will, and left for Egypt. And they remained there until the death of Herod. So the escape to Egypt is hearkening back to what jo Jacob and his family had to do. You remember the story of Joseph? Joseph in the many colored coat and how he went to Egypt and became the second in command in Egypt. And there was a great famine in the land, right? And he had to, he had to save the people uh, through his plan that God gave him. Well, remember when he eventually reunited with his family that Jacob and all of the sons of Israel went to Egypt, right? To escape the famine. So I guarantee you that Matthew is hearkening back to this idea of escaping for, to, to, to avoid a persecution, to avoid a bad situation, they escaped to Egypt. Now, unlike what happened to the people of Israel, how they became slaves in Egypt, what happened in, to Joseph, Mary, and Jesus was probably a very pleasant thing. In that day, in Egypt, in Alexandria, there was a thriving Jewish community. There was even a great synagogue. There, there's historical records about a great synagogue being in Jerusalem. So they being in Alexandria. Sorry, thank you for the face. She's like, what are you talking about? Not Jerusalem. In Alexandria in Egypt, right? There was a great synagogue. Well, there was also a great synagogue in Jerusalem. But so they might have connected with the Jewish community there, and I bet you they actually probably thrived in Alexandria. So it wasn't a bad time, their time in Egypt. But for the purposes of Matthew's midrash here, his interpretation of, of the Hebrew scriptures, Egypt is not the promised land, right? Even Egypt represents slavery, represents uh, not being under God's promises. The promised land is the land of Israel. So Jesus has to be called out of Egypt, and that's why he said this, quoting Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, quoting Hosea 11, 1. Out of Egypt I called my son. Now remember, he's not... Quoting this literally, because who is being referred to when, when Hosea said, out of Egypt I called my son? Talking about Israel. Israel is God's son that was called out of Egypt when they had to leave Egypt in the story of Moses, right? Now, so the reason why I think Matthew is using Midrash here, I highlighted it there for you. It says, this was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Hosea in that case. So I think he's hinting towards the fact that this isn't the literal meaning of the text. It's what God had spoken through the prophet for future generations to see with the benefit of further revelation, in light of further revelation. 
So Hosea's words here originally meant Israel was my son that was called out of Egypt, right? But who here can re recognize that if you see the phrase my son in relation to God, who are you going to think about? Jesus, right? Jesus is the son of God. So Hosea, or rather, um, Matthew is looking at the text of Hosea here and is seeing, well, I know who my son is in relation to God. That's Jesus. So he's seeing the fact that Jesus is the embodiment of Israel, and he had to be called out of Egypt just like I, Israel was. I flipped the picture there. So this is them now leaving Egypt. <laughs> Before they were entering into Egypt, now they're leaving Egypt. Jesus is the embodiment of Israel. He is the only legitimate son of God, not just because he was begotten by God, but because he lives out everything that God expected Israel to be. He was obedient to his ways, to God's ways, right? He reflects God. This is why uh, Simeon last week said that Jesus is the glory of God's people Israel. Why? Because he lives out everything that God expected Israel and, and still expects Israel to, to be and do. So, I want to reiterate this, and I apologize for harping on this as, as often as I do, but we can't disconnect our relationship to Jesus from the greater relationship he has with Israel. He is the embodiment of Israel, and if we are his followers, that means we're going to be a part of, of the people of Israel in that sense, right? We will have a place among them, and we should be inspired to be like them, especially and specifically as modeled and lived out by Jesus. So let's look at this not very fun topic of Herod and the slaughter of the babies in Bethlehem. Matthew tells us more specifically what Herod did in response to the perceived threat of the newborn king. He said, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the Magi, he became very enraged and sent and slew all the male children who were in Bethlehem and all its vicinity from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the Magi. From the Magi. So you see there, that why would he pick two years of age and under? Well, it means that they didn't go there on the night of Jesus' birth. It must have been some time after his birth, probably many months. So just to be sure, Herod had all the male, child's, uh, male children who were two years of age and under killed in Bethlehem. Now, this is a horrific thing, but Bethlehem was a small village, and there probably weren't a lot of male children two years age and under. So it's not the great slaughter that we might imagine, but who here knows, and we all know, that one baby being slaughtered is, is horrific and, and unforgivable, right? So this is not perhaps as horrible as we might have imagined, but it is still a horrific event. And of course, the killing of the male ch ch children in Bethlehem is supposed to remind us of what happened in the days of the birth of Moses. Remember what I said? Like the, the final redeemer will be like the first redeemer. Just like in the days of Moses and the fact that the, the, the children, the newborn children, the firstborns were, were killed, Matthew includes this story to indicate to his readers that Jesus is the final redeemer, the one like Moses. <laughs> Matthew also quoted, what's happening here is Matthew also quoted Jeremiah talking about the slaughter of the, the, the children in Bethlehem. It says, Then what had been spoken through Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. A voice heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and she refused to be comforted because they were no more. Again, as I said, he's quoting Jeremiah 31, verse 15, which is a text that originally referred to the mourning over the captivity and exile of the people of Judah. So Rachel, who was Rachel? She was the mother of Joseph and Benjamin, and therefore of the tribes of Israel that came out of that. And it's, in, the, in the text of Jeremiah, it's, it's, it's almost as if Rachel is looking ahead and, and foreseeing the fact that there would be great trouble and persecution for, the, for her children, for the people of Israel. And so she's mourning and weeping over it. And in fact, Rachel's tomb is actually near Bethlehem. So the, the, the whole imagery here is, is that Matthew is taking this idea of Rachel mourning for her children, and she's connecting it to this slaughter of the babies in Bethlehem. Now, we're not supposed to take this literally. Rachel didn't know about the slaughter of, of the children in Bethlehem. 
So he's using this in a midrashic way. He's, he's pointing out he's a, a word or a phrase to get us to have a greater, deeper understanding of it. The point being is that God's people go through terrible things, and they're in need of a Savior. They're in need of comfort and rescuing. And this is obviously then pointing us towards the fact that Jesus is going to be that final Redeemer who will rescue them from, the, from their terrible situation. Now, then the text says that they returned to Nazareth. In fact, Herod died in 2.19, and an angel instructed Joseph in a dream that it was now safe to go back to the land of Israel. But then Matthew continued saying, when he had heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then after being warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee and came and lived in a city called Nazareth. So Joseph and Mary and Jesus were free to return to the land of Israel. They knew they could now return back to the land of Israel. But rather than going back to Bethlehem, where they had just established themselves, right? And they, they got away from the controversy of Mary's conception, of Jesus' conception. They moved to Bethlehem, and they had family there, and they were probably being established there. But now, because of how terrible this new king was, they decided to move to Nazareth instead. Let's talk about Archelaus, if I'm pronouncing that right. He took over for his father Herod. And... Uh, the reason why he, Joseph wanted to avoid being anywhere near this new king is because he was just as terrible as his father Herod. In fact, there was a lot of hope that maybe he wouldn't have been among the Jewish people. They thought maybe he won't be as bad. So they actually began to protest to him in the temple courts. There was a, a great number of protests. And they were protesting the fact that Herod had arrested so many people during his reign. So they were protesting, hoping that this new king, Archelaus, would release these prisoners that were under, uh, under arrest under the reign of Herod. So how did Archelaus respond to them? Did he release the prisoners? No, he was just as bad as his father. He went and killed and, and sent troops into the temple courts, and they indiscriminately killed 3,000 people, including the protesters. But guess what? Including probably a bunch of innocent people as well. Well, they were all innocent in a sense, but do you know what I mean? Bystanders just killed a bunch of worshipers. He did this during the festival of Passover as well. So this news of this horrific event probably reached Joseph, right? We're not told this in the text, but we know this from the historical record. Reached Joseph and he realized, okay, I can't go back there. He's just going to have, it's just going to be more of the same. So I'm going to go back to my hometown of Nazareth. So he, they returned to a city called Nazareth. Let's look at Nazareth for a second. That's where Jesus was raised. That's why we say he was Jesus of Nazareth, right? And in fact, Matthew says the fact that they returned back to Nazareth was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets, that he shall be called a Nazarene. Where's that from? Anybody know where that's from? Where is he quoting from? Anybody know? Nowhere. In the Bible, there's the Hebrew scriptures say this. That was a trick question. We could have been here all day. <laughs> I don't think that you guys want that, though. Um, there is no scripture that says that Jesus, or the Messiah, was going to be called a Nazarene. So what is Matthew talking about? Well, he's not saying that there is a quote. In fact, the Greek reflects this. He's not saying that there's an actual quote saying he will be called a Nazarene. Instead, what he's saying is the prophets sort of teach that he will be, it's appropriate that he would be called a Nazarene. And there's no great answer to that why he said this, but here's a couple of theories that I, I like and I favor. Firstly, one theory, is that being called a Nazarene means that he would become, he would be from, sorry to use this phrase, he would be from a hick town. <laughs> Nazareth was a small town where lowly people lived. And this fulfills kind of what is said here in Isaiah 53, among other places. That Jesus was supposed to sprout up like a twig before God, like a root out of parched soil. He had no stately form or majesty that might catch our attention. No special appearance that we should want to follow him. Now, let's not name any towns by name here, but think of a hick town. Think of a town that we make fun of, right? Well, imagine the Messiah comes out of that town. The great king comes out of that town. Well, you wouldn't think that there would be anything special about that person. In fact, when... Nathaniel was told about him, what did he say? When, when Nathaniel was said that Jesus is the Messiah and he came out of Nazareth, he said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Why? Because it wasn't a great town. 
It was a bunch of lowly people, lowly surroundings. Jesus came from lowly surroundings. So that's one possible reason why Matthew said that he shall be called a Nazarene, meaning not necessarily that he should be called uh, 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 from, because he's from the town of Nazareth, but because he was supposed to come from that sort of surroundings and a town like that. Another theory that I like is that Matthew is referring to a prophecy from Isaiah chapter 11. It says, then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse and a branch, notice that word, a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The word Nazareth is, comes from a Hebrew word, not Sarah, which means branch. So that's where that, why I highlighted that word there. Uh, it's the Hebrew word that Sarah, which means branch. And it became associated with the Messiah. Why? Because it's saying that a shoot will spring from Jesse, that's the father of David, and a branch, and that Sarah, from his roots, will bear fruit. Talking about the Messiah, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him. So, a lot of people think that Nazareth may have been founded by the descendants of David, the house of David. And they called the town Nazareth, basically, we can translate it, branch town. Right? It's the, the town of the people who are of the branch who are of the Messiah, who are of the king of Israel. So that's probably why Joseph originally, Joseph and Mary originally lived there, and that's why Jesus, or rather Joseph, returned Mary and Joseph uh, to Nazareth, is because that's the town where the descendants of David lived. So it's likely that Matthew meant, not that there's an actual verse that he would be called a Nazarene, but that the Messiah would be somebody who would come from lowly surroundings, and he would be someone who would come from Nazareth, who was founded by these descendants of David, the people who were hoping for this branch that would come, that would be the Messiah. Now, guess what? Who here knows what we Christians are called in Hebrew? Going all the way back to the early days of the first century, to this day, if we were to go to Israel, where they speak Hebrew, what would Christians be called? Does anybody know? Any of the Friday night group know? Close, yeah. But it's the Hebrew word, Notsri. You hear the word Netzer in that, in that, Nazareth? It means, where are the people who follow the one from Nazareth? So even to this day, we are called Nazarene. That's an early term for Christians, for followers of Jesus. I say it's a wonderful term. Not that I care about the town of Nazareth. We went to the town of Nazareth when we were in Israel. It's not that great. <laughs> but the fact that Jesus came from there, and it has that significance in relation to this prophecy about the Messiah, I say that's a title we should adopt and wear with pride. We are the notes three. We are the, the ones who follow the man from Nazareth. I think that's a great title for us. All right, that's Matthew. That's, that's, he is concluding here his story of the early life of Jesus. We are done the birth narratives in Matthew now. So, but there's one more story for us to look at. What time is it here? All right, we've got some time. One more story to look at. Let's all take a stretch. We one more story. I, I think we, we can use that, right? We're going to turn now to Luke chapter 2, right? The end of Luke chapter 2, we're going to conclude his uh, birth narratives, if you will, except this is now Jesus at 12 years old. Last week, we looked at all of the events that took place when Jesus, Mary, and Joseph went to the temple. Now we're seeing that they are back at the temple again 12 years later. In fact, it says his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And this comes from the fact that in the Torah, God commands his people to go to Jerusalem for Passover, for Pentecost, and for the Feast of Booths every single year. Each year, every, all the Jewish people are commanded, or Jewish males at least, are commanded to go to Israel when there's a temple. Not right now, but when there's a temple, you're commanded to go to Israel to celebrate the, the festivals there. They obeyed that commandment. They went to Jerusalem every year for the Feast of Passover. And we learned that Exodus 23 and other places. So this continues the theme from last week that Joseph and Mary were devout, faithful Israelites. They followed God's ways in the Torah. Luke takes the time to tell us that they went to Jerusalem for Passover at that specific time when Jesus was 12 years old. The feast was over. The family began to travel back to Nazareth. However, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem without his parents realizing it. And guess what? These trips back and forth to, to Jerusalem would have been in large caravans of people, right? It wasn't just G Jesus, Joseph, and Mary, because they were traveling in large caravans. They probably assumed 
that Jesus was among family or friends in the large caravan, right? That's the way it was back then. Yeah, Jesus, our child's off with family and friends. It's fine. But it took three days, right? So they returned back to Jerusalem. Three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. Jesus was there in the temple, listening to the, the, to the Torah teachers and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now, it was, this isn't just some random event. It was the practice of the Torah teachers, of the rabbis, to make themselves available in the temple courts for questions and answers, for, for people to ask questions, for them to provide answers and to go back and forth. So Jesus is including himself in this, in this practice. He's asking questions. He's giving answers and so on and so forth. He's holding his own with the top Torah teachers of the day. Have you ever heard of Rabbi Hillel? That was the top Torah teacher of the day, Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai. And Jesus was probably there with Rabbi Hillel and these other teachers. In fact, Jesus is influenced by Rabbi Hillel. You'll see that when we look at Jesus' teachings. So Jesus had clearly, obviously, been raised, or at least it seems to me, he had been raised in the traditional Jewish manner. He knew the scriptures from a very young age. He was taught the scriptures. He was even well-versed in the... Uh, Jewish law and interpretation and the way the legal rulings of Judaism. So that's why all who heard him were amazed, right? There he is among the, the Torah teachers, among the crowd. All who heard him were amazed. He had not been formally trained, and he was not going to be formally trained, apparently. He was never formally trained. So where did this young boy get such wisdom? Well, they didn't know this, but he's the Son of God, right? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He, now, he's a real, genuine human being, is he not? So he had to learn and grow just like every other child. However, I do believe, and I wonder if you agree with me, that he had a unique connection to God, his Father, right? And he was filled with the Holy Spirit that, that even though he was from Nazareth, and everybody, most people, when he grew up, they were going to write him off as uneducated. He wasn't formally trained. He's not a real rabbi. But that doesn't mean that he wasn't truly a man of God who knew scripture, even at this young age. That reminds me then that we shouldn't just write off people who might not have the right education or might not have the right credentials. Those are good. Those are, those are good things. But we must realize God can work through anyone and can use anyone for his purposes, even if it, don't see, if it doesn't seem that way. So the passage ends with Mary and Joseph finding Jesus, asking him why he stayed behind. And Jesus responded, for, I don't think Jesus had any ill intent toward his parents, obviously, right? Like, he just was so immersed in what was happening, he probably himself lost track of time. Which is why he says to his parents, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? That verse can also be translated, did you not know I had to be about my father's affairs? I had to be consumed with God and his ways here in his temple courts. So even at this young age, I think Jesus was at least beginning to know of his special relationship with God and as of his role as Messiah. Again, as I said, I don't think Jesus intended to trouble his parents, but he was the Messiah. So of course he would be talking about God's ways in the temple courts with the rabbis. And, and it says that Joseph and Mary didn't even quite understand, right? That they did they, that this is odd. They knew he was the Messiah. They didn't quite understand what Jesus meant when he said, I had to be about my father's affairs, or I had to be in my father's house. But because they are human beings just like the rest of us, Joseph and Mary, I know Catholics and such will say that Mary is some divine figure. She was a regular human being. She was a mother just like so many of you. She, was, she couldn't, even though she knew the truth about Jesus, there's still something human about saying, our son is really going to be the Messiah, the great king of Israel, and that he was going to have that great connection with God. Now, the point is, is that they maybe didn't understand, but of course Jesus would have been there talking with the rabbis about God and his ways. But nevertheless, Jesus returned to Nazareth with Mary and Joseph and lived out his life there in Nazareth. Again, that's why we say he's Jesus of Nazareth, because that's where he was raised. So we conclude our look at Jesus' early life. We actually don't know anything from Scripture, at least not explicitly, from the age of 12 to 30. 
We're not given any stories or any information about, at least in the Gospels, about what he did from, the age, from age 12 to 30. But we are told this in Luke. That Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. So even though we've taken now two Sundays to look at Jesus' early life, we're actually not told a whole lot about his early life. But one thing is for sure, and we're getting it from this, that he was born at the right time and he was raised by the right people. Who here admires Joseph and Mary? I admire them, right? That they were men, a man and woman of God who faithfully kept God's ways and were, were invested in that, and they invested in raising Jesus. And so, though they were living under Roman occupation, and at that point in Israel's history, they were under occupation by Rome, it was still possible to live a peaceful life, a life of learning and growing. So I hope we take inspiration, that no matter our circumstances, are we living in the best circumstances? No, not the best. But we live in good enough circumstances, do we not? Where we can live a peaceful life, we can live a life of growing in wisdom, growing and learning, and, and, and learning God's ways and growing in that. So I hope we can take inspiration. Let's have Paul come as we're going to sing our last song today. That Jesus and his family were a part of faithful Israel. Right? That's, that's what we've been looking at these past two weeks as we look at Jesus' early life. That Jesus and his parents and John the Baptist and his parents, they were a part of faithful Israel. Simeon and Anna, these are all the faithful remnant of Israel. And so I want us to continue to get to know Jesus more along those lines. And we do that by going deeper into the Gospels. Is it okay if we continue this series? Can I get a show of hands? Let's continue with John the Baptist next week. You can read up on all the scriptures we're going to be looking at over the next couple weeks. And we're going to look at the amazing ministry of John the Baptist and how that sets up the ministry of Jesus. But for now, we're going to sing one last song. And we are not going to rely in our lives on what we're used to, what comes easy, but instead we're going to come to God, come to the altar, repent of our sin, and allow God to transform us. Let's sing the song again.